You have now joined the SOBC webinar targeting mechanistic targets for intervening with racial disparities. Uh, to When I say you're joining, I assume you're either live or we have hopefully a couple hundred people that will join us live, or you're watching this as part of the SOBC um, YouTube link, or perhaps you're joining us as part of the Division 12 program offering CEs for this program. So welcome, and I will turn it over to Dr. Simmons from NIH to give us a brief introduction. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I just wanted to, on behalf of the National Institute on Aging, which um, supports the SOBC Resource and Coordinating Center um, and their activities, such as this webinar, um, to welcome everyone. Um, these uh, series of grand round webinars that SOBC uh, puts on are uh, a very exciting opportunity that we like to take advantage of to help people learn about uh, the SOBC approach. And SOBC seeks to strengthen behavioral intervention development through a focus on mechanisms of behavior change and on the experimental medicine approach. And these, as I said, these interdisciplinary webinars are intended to broadly engage behavioral scientists in discussions of how to conduct rigorous behavioral change research, um, how to consider the challenges associated with doing so, and also to highlight high interest areas and new scientific directions, um, all of which will be covered, I think, in today's exciting webinar, which in which we'll hear from three leaders um, in the field on mechanistic targets for intervening racial disparities, a focus on race-related stressors, health literacy, and physician-patient interactions. I'll turn it back over to our moderator, Dr. Otto. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Yeah, and let me tell uh, the audience just a little bit about our structure today. Um, as Janine said, we have three absolute experts in this domain who are gonna be giving a 40-minute talk each. So we will have three 40-minute talks followed by discussion. We do want your comments and questions. And for that, down at the bottom of the page, you will see your Q&A bar. And so we'd love our audience to put in your questions. If you want to, you could direct that toward a particular speaker or direct that question toward the panel that we'll have at the conclusion of three speakers. And then I will be going through and uh, offering up the questions to our speakers during our last half hour or so together at the end of the talks. Um, you, any of those listening will not uh, be live. And so use that Q&A button. And I don't think you can unmute, but make sure you stay muted uh, anyway during this course of this talk. Um, I also want to thank Dylan Gould uh, from Boston University and Issa Khan from the Coordinating Center at Columbia Medical Center for helping us get to this point and, uh, and uh, helping getting all the contact together today. I also want to thank Division 12 for being able to offer this program as CEs as a recorded event. I think that is everything, but oh, I will um, be introducing each speaker just before she or he talks. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Cooper, Dr. Cooper's internist, a social epidemiologist, and James F. Fry's professor of medicine and the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Equity in Health and Healthcare at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, Nursing, and Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Cooper is a leading researcher on health disparities uh, and uh, actually one of the first scientists to help document uh, disparities um, in care in relation to physician-patient relationships. Oh, and I do want to say, do listen in as you listen for mechanistic targets. Hopefully, we'll provide them at every level of analysis, individual, dyadic as well, as well as more structural and community-based. So with that introduction, Dr. Cooper, would you lead us forward? Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here and to um, provide this lecture, but also just to engage with everyone who um, is participating, including my colleagues who are also speaking. So I am going to share my screen and then we should be able to start. Okay, so it's my pleasure to talk to you today about uh, reducing health disparities by improving relationships in healthcare. 
I have no conflicts to disclose. And I just want to start out before we actually start the, the topic for today is just to start out with some context around health disparities. And if you're attending this lecture, you probably already know this, is that in order to address health disparities, we have to learn about all the complex interactions uh, that occur among multiple factors uh, that affect people in different groups differently, uh, all the way from individual behaviors to institutional and, so and social and economic policies that perpetuate the broader structural factors. So in the lecture that I'm going to give today, we're gonna to focus on the health system factors and the social relationships within healthcare that can either perpetuate health disparities or if we actually intervene upon them in a positive way, we can help to reduce those, those disparities and to enhance health equity. So the objectives for the session are that after this session, you will be able to list uh, any relationship dimensions for which racial disparities have been documented. You'll be able to describe individual level uh, relationship-centered intervention approaches that can be used to reduce racial disparities in healthcare. And then you'll also be able to discuss organizational level approaches to reducing disparities in the quality of relationships in healthcare. So let's start out uh, talking about what we know about racial disparities and dimensions of relationships in healthcare. And this probably goes without saying for those of you who are attending today, but why focus on the patient physician relationship or relationships in healthcare for, you know, for any matter whatsoever. And that's because relationships are associated with important health outcomes. We know that when there's high quality of, of patient physician relationships, that patients are more likely to uh, recall information that they're given to understand their conditions better, uh, that it's related to improved patient adherence and continuity of care, to patient satisfaction, to trust, as well as to subclinical outcomes, uh, including reduction of pain, resolution of depression, and in some studies, control of diabetes and hypertension. So it's an important um, contributor or mechanistic uh, contributor to disparities in care and also in health outcomes. So when we think about communication, uh, many people have used the metaphor of the iceberg uh, concept of culture. And this is an article, uh, this comes from an article that I wrote with some colleagues uh, some time ago, actually in 2006, where we really talked about um, what we need to do, what we need to do to better understand the factors that influence relationships. So, you know, in reality, what we, we see is just the things that are above the surface. But as we all know that there are many things that are below the surface that influence the way we think, we behave, um, we perceive our environment, and we perceive uh, what's you know, the, the people that are interacting around us. And so um, sometimes we look at the surface factors and oftentimes those are the factors that influence our interactions with others. And the reason for the, the metaphor of the cultural iceberg is that um, it's associated with danger because if we don't uh, understand those factors that are below the surface, um, we can inadvertently uh, cause uh, harm, right? So working to re improve relationships across social differences uh, involves risk and the issues are deep and complex. And so when we think about these disparities that we're going to learn about, you're gonna think about the fact that we might be looking at these disparities that exist uh, along sort of characteristics that are seen on the surface, but in order to better understand them, we need to understand all of the factors. So first, I just want to share with you some of what's known based on some work that I've done, but also many other people in the field. So early, in my early research, my colleagues and I conducted interviews with patients, and we showed that African Americans had lower levels of trust in their doctors than whites, and that most uh, people of color actually reported uh, feeling less respect and less encouragement by health professionals to participate in decisions about their care. We then went on to do studies where we actually recorded routine medical visits, and we found that physicians actually talked more. They were more verbally dominant 
and they engaged in less rapport building and in conversation about psychosocial conversation when seeing African-American patients than when seeing white patients. We also did studies where we found that the positive affect or the friendliness, uh, sort of general friendly tone among physicians um, was lower in visits when they were seeing patients of color. And we found that in other studies that uh, positive affect is actually associated with trust and that that association is even stronger uh, among uh, African-Americans and Hispanic patients than it was among white patients. So there were several uh, sort of observational studies that were documenting disparities early on. Then we went on to really look at um, whether the race or ethnicity of the clinician played a role. So in the study where we had, again, recorded these medical visits uh, between patients and physicians who had established relationships, we found that when African-American patients saw white physicians, their visits were shorter and both the doctor and the patient sounded more rushed, less interested and less friendly. Um, whereas in contrast, when they were race concordant, where they shared racial identity, the visits were longer, patients sounded happier, there was more participatory decision-making and higher satisfaction. We also found that when there was concordance of, across multiple characteristics that had a positive cumulative effect on patient physician communication and on patient perceptions of care. Now, this is not surprising, but it certainly isn't why most clinicians go into healthcare is, you know, we don't all expect to treat people who look like us or who are more like us socially uh, any differently or any better than people who aren't like us. So this was, of course, um, worrisome. And we knew that most physicians weren't doing this intentionally. So we designed another study to look at how racial attitudes among doctors influence patient care. And we gave them a test called the IAT or the Implicit Association Test. And this is a test where you're supposed to match good and bad words with faces of people belonging to different social groups like race. And if you match the good words with white faces and the bad words with black faces faster, then you can match the good words with black faces and the bad words with white faces. Then psychologists say that that indicates you have an implicit racial bias that favors whites over blacks. So in this small cross-sectional study of 40 primary care um, physicians and um, almost uh, 300 patients in urban community practices, we looked to see whether the scores of clinicians on uh, implicit attitudes tests was associated with the way they communicated with their patients. Now we found that 70% of these primary care physicians basically had a general race preference favoring whites over blacks. And then when we did another sort of implicit association test that was specifically designed for medical professionals, where the words were not just good or bad, but they were words like uh, trusting and cooperative um, uh, versus suspicious, we found that basically 70% um, of clinicians had that stereotype that Black patients were going to be less adherent or, or cooperative than white patients. And 70% had an implicit preference for whites over blacks. We also found that the scores on these implicit tests, the more bias favoring whites over blacks or more of a negative stereotype about black patients led to poor communication in the visits of black patients. So more verbal dominance, more talking by the physician and not allowing the patient to talk as much, less patient centeredness, so less of the conversation focused on the patient's agenda and on psychosocial issues, and then also poorer ratings of respectfulness, trust, and partnership, especially among African-American patients. So we're gonna revisit the cultural iceberg for a moment. And the reason why I'm showing you this slide is because in the clouds, what I've shown to you is that these are the dimensions of relationship for which we documented disparities in patient-physician communication. So respectfulness, communication, trust, partnership, fairness, so that's like, um, you know, the lack of bias and concordance. And so these are the potentially the intervention uh, fo focus areas that we would want to address if we wanted to intervene in some way to uh, eliminate disparities. So now I'm going to talk to you about how we reduce disparities in healthcare by enhancing relationship-centered care. And I'm going to focus on two uh, main approaches. One that focuses on communication skills, 
and another one that focuses specifically on bias management uh, approaches. So first, uh, I think this comes as no surprise to many of you is that, you know, relationships between individuals occur in a broader context. So this is an ecological model that we adopted from the work of Fisher and colleagues, and it highlights the individual patient, the family and social network, the organization and provider factors, as well as the policy and community uh, influences on healthcare disparities. And so as you can see, you might want to intervene on any one of these levels or more if you actually want to influence these processes and interactions and relationships within the healthcare setting that contribute to the disparate outcomes that we see with health disparities. So, you know, clearly if we want to intervene on relationships, we need to think about the fact that we could intervene at, on any one of these levels, but if we only, only intervene on one of them, there might be other factors going on at other levels that could be influencing the success of our intervention approach. So we're gonna go on to talk about what, uh, what some of the relationship-centered uh, approaches might be to address health disparities. So what is relationship-centeredness or relationship-centered care? It's an important framework uh, for conceptualizing healthcare that considers the personhood of everyone in healthcare. So not just the patient, but also the clinicians and other um, participants, other family members, um, other uh, health professionals, other frontline staff. So these are the unique characteristics, values, experiences, perspectives of the, of the individual people involved in the care process. Um, and then considering that each of these people has an ethical status and should be treated with respect. So there may be many relationships, but there are some key relationships that we consider when we're trying to improve relationship centeredness. That's the relationship of, of the health professional to themselves or their own self-awareness, relationships with patients, relationships with colleagues, and then also relationships with community. Now for today, we're probably gonna focus primarily on the relationship with patients, although um, you can, as you can see, some of these uh, factors uh, have like spillover effects. So I wanna tell you about a study that it's, it's been done. It's a, a long time ago, but I would say this is one of the studies that I led that um, was one of the early studies specifically focusing on how to improve the patient-physician relationship by not just um, uh, working with clinicians, but also working with patients. So this was a randomized uh, trial. It was a factorial design, meaning that when we randomly assigned um, patients, we well, first we randomly assigned clinicians to get an intensive versus a less intensive intervention. And then among the physicians, we then randomly assigned their patients to get a more intensive uh, uh, intervention or to get a, a minimal intervention. So we had 42 primary care clinicians, about 279 patients, 60% of whom were African-American, were all having high blood pressure. They were from 15 community-based practices in Baltimore. And the clinician uh, training was computer-based communication skills training uh, versus uh, simply like a, a, a monthly newsletter. And then the patient uh, program was patient activation by a community health worker. So those patients who were randomly assigned to that intervention had six contacts, one in person and then five by phone with a community health worker who acted as a coach. And the goal was to improve patient participation in decisions uh, in medication adherence, and then to improve blood pressure control over 12 months. So the, the physician communication skills training actually was delivered again by computer, was uh, used a videotaped uh, encounter. And so each of the clinicians had to agree to be recorded with a standardized patient. And that patient portrayed sort of um, the common kinds of um, barriers and concerns that are seen among uh, African-American patients with uncontrolled hypertension who live in underserved communities. And so they were all videotaped with this standardized patient. And then their, their individualized uh, video recording was uh, given back to them with feedback uh, about their behaviors. And, and what you can see here is that there's a visual display of the patient and physician behaviors. You can see where uh, these hatch marks uh, on this bar are revealing when every statement that is made by the doctor or the patient. So it shows you kind of how much the doctor and patient are speaking, 
Um, it shows you the number of statements that are in each category of communication. And it really lets the clinician know how much time they're spending in the visit devoted to, to a variety of different issues. Um, and then if the clinician, for example, didn't engage in a particular behavior, there's at the bottom here, you can see there's a glossary, which where there are examples of best practices of these behaviors and the specific proficiencies that we were looking for in this study where that clinician should be able to probe the full spectrum of the patient's concerns early in the visit. They should be able to probe for knowledge and beliefs. They should monitor adherence and, uh, and identify any problems and help to address those problems and then elicit a commitment to the plan. And so clinicians could look in the glossary to see what uh, the best practice examples were of that. And they could also look to see their own examples to see how well they did with accomplishing those skills. Now this program took two hours to, to do and we gave people CME credit. And you'll see that our, the science has evolved over time because as you can imagine, these, these had to be highly motivated uh, volunteer physicians uh, to engage in this. Um, so here are the skills we focused on for communication, patient-centered communication skills. For data gathering, we focused on having them use open-ended questions. Um, and what we call open to close cones, starting out with open-ended questions such as like, how can I help you today? And then moving to more specific closed-ended questions about uh, uh, you know, what the patient's concerns might be. Balancing biomedical and psychosocial questions, so not focusing specifically only on the biomedical issue. In terms of relationship building, we focused on them showing empathy and concern um, and providing reassurance and support to the patient and affirming the patient. All of these things were included in an accompanying workbook to the, the computer program. For activating and partnership building, we focused on them asking for the patient's opinion, learning how to reflect and paraphrase, and summarizing uh, what they heard and checking uh, with the patient to make sure the patient understood what they were, they were saying, uh, having the patient uh, use what we call teach back. And I'm sure you'll hear more about this uh, later, but basically, basically asking the patient to explain in their own words. And in terms of education and counseling, we focused on them providing information in short, clear statements, avoiding verbal dominance, and again, balancing biomedical and psychosocial information. So for the patient activation skills training, a community health worker delivered this program, and um, they focused on a number of different areas, but they really wanted um, uh, patients to be prepared for the visit to know, to be prepared with what concerns they have for today, um, what concerns they have specific to hypertension, um, if they had some uh, concerns about how they were going, how they might communicate their concerns to the physician, practicing that with a with the community health worker, how they were going to ask those questions, and uh, and actually even maybe writing them down in in a little diary. And so this is how what the, the pre-visit coaching was like. And then they would get a post-visit uh, debrief. And the photo in the uh, lower left-hand corner is just an, ex uh, it, there was an accompanying sort of photo novella that went along with the study, which was a series, uh, a story that followed uh, an African-American uh, woman with hypertension in her life and her interaction with her clinician. So what were our results? We actually found that patients who were coached by community health workers and whose physicians had the communication skills training showed greater improvements in information exchange with their physician, participation in decision-making, and then also in their blood pressure. Um, the effect on racial disparities was that the patient intervention, the coaching uh, actually was associated with improved patient positive affect. So patients who were in that coaching group felt, sounded happier, more relaxed, and more engaged in their visits. Um, and then in the physician intervention improved participatory decision-making in Blacks to a greater extent than it did in whites, but it still didn't eliminate the disparities that we had seen uh, at baseline. So we eliminated some, but not all disparities, and we did show improvements, but it needed both the patient and clinician intervention to do that. When we used either one or the other, there was some improvement, but it was not as great as the improvement that we saw with the combined interventions. So moving along, we decided based on feedback from that first study to do another trial. This one was a multi-level uh, pragmatic trial. So 
We were engaged with thousands of patients across six primary care practices in a large network. And we, we were trying out several things. This was related to hypertension again. We provided blood pressure measurement training to the frontline staff. We delivered care management to the patients by uh, a registered dietitians and pharmacist team. And then we had a clinician education focus. And that one, we really did want to incorporate some communication skills training. And this time we got feedback from the clinicians that you know, they needed specific communication skills training. They didn't feel like a broad training would be that helpful to them, but their most uh, worrisome concern was related to how to really understand, assess, and promote patient adherence uh, to medications. So we developed a more specific training program with other feedback we got was that two hours was too long. So we developed a very practical uh a program that could be delivered in about 10 minutes on a website. This is the homepage for the website uh, here that you can see there's a video from the director of the health care organization welcoming the doctors and encouraging them to do this program, uh, letting them know that they're going to get what we call RVUs or productivity credits for participating in this. Um, it really only was going to take 10 to 15 minutes to do this. They could choose a patient, one of the three patients, or they could actually navigate the website by focusing on specific skills. Um, and either way, as long as they went through uh, the, in, the entire website, they would get productivity credits based on that. So the sheet that you see sort of on the right-hand side is, is kind of like the summary sheet that people got after they completed the program that gave them examples of what the key skills were uh, related to assessment and, of adherence and then partnering with patients and gave them examples of those things. So what I would like to do is just to share with you an example of one of the patients whose name is Mrs. Lewis. My name is Rita Lewis. I am 65 years old, and I was born and raised in Baltimore City. I have a grown daughter who lives nearby with her family, and she calls me frequently. She visits when she can. I'm a widow. I live alone but I'm a religious person and attend church regularly. Lately, I've been worried about my health and that happens when you get to my age. I wanna make sure I'm right with my Lord. My blood pressure's up and my knees are bothering me again. Last time the doctor told me my blood pressure's too high. He's worried about it. Well, it worries me too. High blood pressure runs in my family and my sister died of a stroke last year. I live alone and there's no one to remind me to take my medicine. And there are so many of them. Sometimes I lose track of time and forget about the medicine. Or I remember to take one pill, but forget about the other. Or can't remember which pill I took. I guess I'm not that organized about it. Sometimes I wonder how so many pills can be good for you. My name is Oops. Rita. Sorry about that. <laughs> so that's Mrs. Lewis. And my um, name is Rita. I'm going to try to make sure we move to the next slide. Yeah. So this is an example of some of the assessment skills that we demonstrated. Mrs. Lewis, I know that taking multiple medicines is hard. And you're taking quite a few of those. What problems are you having? Let's talk first about your blood pressure medicines. Can you tell me which ones you're taking? Okay, let me ask about this morning. Did you take any medicines for blood pressure this morning? I see, so it sounds like you're having some trouble. Uh, Mrs. Lewis, tell me what makes it most difficult for you to take your medications as prescribed? Okay, and these are partnership skills now. I noticed that this morning your blood pressure is a little bit elevated. It may be a little discouraging uh, to find that your blood pressure is not where you'd like it to be, but I'm confident that we'll get it under control working together.
Is there anything that you found personally helpful in the past to keep track of your medications? You mentioned earlier that your daughter uses a pill box uh, to keep track of her own medications. How would that work out for you? Just to be sure I explained this clearly, could you tell me how you'll keep track of your medications? Okay, so you got a sense of what those are all about. So now I want to talk to you about ways to manage bias and stereotyping and what we know about what works or what we're learning. So that's a field that's growing. So one of the things we are learning through this work um, is that increasing cultural, social, and personal awareness uh, is important. So basically uh, having people be exposed to tests like the implicit association test, but not doing that just alone. Also giving them strategies to manage uh, what when they find out uh, that they might have an implicit bias to manage that in some way. So doing that along with increasing contacts with people from different groups, increasing uh, motivation among clinicians and other health professionals to control their prejudice. So they might actually uh, set specific anti-bias goals or uh, engage in what we call stereotype replacement. So basically um, thinking about someone who doesn't fit uh, the stereotype that you think you uh, about a particular group and doesn't fit that, that's actually counter stereotype imaging. Stereotype replacement is basically um, noticing what you're uh, observing about someone and uh, also noting how in what ways they contradict what you might have assumed about them. Individuation, again, is like getting to know people as individuals and really thinking about what makes them unique. And then developing skills. And some of the skills are related to uh, mindfulness and, and regulation of one's emotions. So emotions management, also partnership building communication skills training is another way to manage uh, bias. And then finally, perspective taking has to do with uh, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So these are some of the strategies that are currently being incorporated to, to manage bias and stereotyping. We know we can't actually el eliminate it but it's something that needs to be managed. And a lot of research is going on right now, looking at what some of the best approaches are uh, to, uh, to managing bias such, such that it actually improves processes and outcomes of care. And so I'm not actually naive enough to think that a checklist will, will get rid of this, but I have um, recommended a checklist for uh, implicit bias reduction and communication improvement that physicians can use. And actually this, uh, tool called RELATE has been used uh, in a study of uh, medical and family medicine residents and is actually shown uh, improvements in, in skills and, uh, and some outcomes. So it's basically reflect what you hear from the patient and respect their humanity, empathize or imagine yourself in their shoes, listen more and talk less, affirm and support patients asking about uh, what assumptions you're making and whether they are actually based on facts about the person in front of you, talking with uh, patients and not uh, about themselves and their lives and not just about their medical problems and using teach back. And then finally, engaging patients in problem solving and decision making. So um, that's a tool related to in individual uh, approaches to improving communication and bias management. Now we're gonna talk just a little bit about organizational approaches to reducing disparities in relationship-centered care. And I'm gonna tell you that through an example of another study um, where we focused on health equity leadership training uh, and social needs care. And we haven't done much of the bystander upstander training yet, but I wanted you to know about it because it's being used uh, widely um, not in healthcare per se, and has been shown to be highly effective. So this trial is called the Rich Life Project. It just ended. It's a large uh, pragmatic trial in Maryland and Pennsylvania with about uh, 1,800 patients with hypertension plus another condition. And we randomly assigned the practices uh, in this study. So there were 30 of them. So we randomly assigned 15 of them to what we called enhanced standard of care or standard of care plus where we only focused on training for clinician staff and system leaders uh, related to hypertension and um, for the system leaders related to health equity. And then the collaborative stepped care uh, 
arm, which received all of the same programs that the Standard of Care Plus program received, but also um, each practice in that arm had a nurse care manager and a community health worker assigned to work with the patients with uncontrolled hypertension. And then we also had a remote specialist team that was available to be consulted if there were a complex medical issues that the patients were facing. Now the main outcomes were blood pressure control and change in blood pressure, but also patient reported outcomes, including patient activation, self-management behaviors and experiences of care. And so the standard of care plus arm, as just as a reminder, included several components, but I'm gonna focus on the health system leaders learning network. And this, this learning network basically included uh, quarterly meetings with health system leaders and uh, clinic uh, champions who were champions of the project. They all, uh, there were 16 uh, one hour trainings uh, basically focused on all the topics you see here on the slide. So you can see that we're focusing, if you look on the right-hand side, uh, on the culture of the organization and on the teamwork, the, so interactions among uh, team members. So effective communication and teamwork, speaking up at psychological safety uh, for people from diverse backgrounds. But we also had sort of higher level uh, focus on what are some of the key understandings of health disparities and health equity? Uh, how do we engage the community? Um, uh, what are some of the practical strategies around monitoring our data and responding and so on and so forth. So, you know, this was a fairly um, intensive intervention for leaders, having leaders focused on the environment that would actually facilitate stronger relationships and relationships across uh, people from different groups. Um, so these are the behaviors we really focused on, uh, leaders recognizing the personhood of the people they lead, motivating and inspiring others to engage and activate, uh, advocate for change related to equity, establish and implement codes of conduct and response processes for managing bias and disrespectful behavior, creating a safe environment for learning and work, communicating uh, authentically, and building equitable partnerships with community-based organizations. Now, the patient part, uh, the collaborative stepped care arm, the more intensive arm that had the more individualized approach, we also worked with care managers and community health workers to train them to engage more, uh, build stronger relationships with, with their patients. So what did we do? We trained them in uh, better assessing patients' social needs. So helping them to develop structural competence, which is what we define as the ability to understand how health inequalities are driven at institutional and societal levels and how to take those factors into account when delivering care to patients. So they needed to sort of recognize that it wasn't only about patients' individual choices and behaviors, but also about their environment and the other sort of broader um, social and policy factors that were impacting their ability to engage in healthful behavior. Um, so some of the social determinants uh, we had them to really focus on, and we know social determinants are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. Um, and when people, when, when individuals report a need related to these negative social risk factors, they are considered to be a social need. And so we had the care managers and community health workers really develop skills in assessing um, patients' needs related to medical concerns, food security, housing, transportation, employment, their needs for social and emotional support, as well as other practical things like um, you know, financial needs to uh, improve their utilities. We also had them uh, gain some skills in talking about racism and discrimination with patients. And uh, these are some resources that um, you can use. You'll have access to the slides at a later date, but basically making sure that they conveyed openness to discussing the topic. Again, this study was going on during the time it did overlap during the, the COVID pandemic and during the time of um, a lot of the uh, Black Lives Matter and you know protests against racism. So this was really um, important at that time. We taught our staff to listen reflectively with uh, empathy and sensitivity, and we reminded them that this was a lifelong process. Now, one of the things we wish we had done but didn't do, um, and something that is being done widely in other fields, is training health professionals how to be effective bystanders or upstanders when they witness discrimination or derogatory behavior being um, 
displayed uh, towards uh, people from marginalized groups. And so what happens with if you're a, an upstander person, basically you support recipients of derogatory behavior, you learn how to confront the actor, you learn how to, to recruit other active bystanders or upstanders, and there's a lot of instruction around how to formally report the incidents and how to seek assistance. And then, you know, there are many different ways to be an upstander. You can confront folks directly. Um, you could bring up conversation where um, you're making sure that um, you're noting that something inappropriate has happened, but you're not necessarily um, confronting the person directly. You could just, you know, make an observation or say, I wonder if this could have been handled in a different way. It can also be done immediately or it could be done uh, after the fact. So uh, these are interventions that have been used in other fields, uh, highly effective in terms of benefits to not only the person who is on the receiving end of the derogatory behavior, but actually also um, to the perpetrator if uh, these behaviors are, are appropriate. So what are some of the challenges, and we're getting close to our wrap up here, some of the challenges in this work in these interventions to, to modify um, behaviors and cultural environment. The objective measurement of these uh, behaviors is often costly. The self-report measures, on the other hand, are subject to social desirability. Um, there's maybe only partial uh, coverage of the concepts we're trying to uh, capture using self-report. A lot of our measures are only visit-based, so it's hard to really examine them over time, particularly in people who are experiencing chronic illness. There are also practice and organizational level measures that if we don't capture them fully, we might not be able to discern a lot of the causes of uh, heterogeneity in our treatment effects. In terms of implementation barriers, there are several barriers that still exist. Often there's a low perceived need. It can be very hard to change organizational culture. There's a lot of demand for productivity and technical quality that competes with this. Um, we found that some incentives did improve engagement, um, and, but we still don't know what the optimal dose of interventions is. How much training and coaching and education is needed? Um, how many boosters are needed? So in conclusion, though, some interventions to improve patient-physician relationships do improve outcomes and reduce disparities. We're learning now that technology, things like using the EMR and using um, uh, technology can actually use to be used to tailor interventions and make them easier to implement. We're learning that multi-level approaches have the potential for synergistic influences and that if we address these implementation and measurement barriers, and we also assess clinical outcomes and costs, that that will provide support for new interventions and policies. So I'm gonna close by saying, if we do this, we can finally reach our vision of health equity. And um, I'm just putting a plug in for my book, Why Are Health Disparities uh, Everyone's Problem? There's a, a discount code that is available to those of you who participated uh, here in the program today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Q Cooper. And I was trying to remember the, the code, if you didn't get it down, was HWHD, if you're going for the book. I think I got that correctly. Um, and remember that we will see Dr. Cooper again in about an hour and a half or so during the panel discussion. Feel free to go ahead and use the, the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to put your questions in now so I can take a look at them and have them ready for the panel discussion. But at this point, let me go ahead and introduce our next international expert, who is Gilbert Gee. Dr. Gee is professor and chair of the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. Dr. Gee is a leader in researching social determinants of health inequities of racial, ethnic, and immigration minority populations using a multi-level and life course perspective. Dr. Gee, lead us forward, please. All right, good afternoon. Uh, let me share my screen. And oops. you're able to see this, I hope? Yes. OK, great. So um, that was a really amazing talk by Dr. Cooper. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these issues related to health inequities, but I'm going to take a couple of steps upstream and really talk more about structural racism, why it's important, why we should all care. And uh, I want to begin by saying I have no conflicts to disclose. 
My point of departure begins with Healthy People 2030, which as you know, is our nation's health planning document. Healthy People uh, basically says that in order to achieve health equity, it requires our societal efforts to uh, address these historic and contemporary injustices in order to uh, eliminate you know, these disparities in health and health care. And in order to do that, we really need to take a hard look at what racism is. And what's very important about thinking about racism and people are starting to recognize more and more today is it's not just about individual level discrimination, prejudice and hate crimes as important as they are, but it's really also about the more structural institutional elements of racism. And these were articulated by many people including Carmichael and Hamilton uh, back in the 60s. This multi-level understanding of race relations and racism uh, fits very well with a more broader understanding of a multi-level ecological understanding of the production of health, right? And so from Bronfenbrenner's work and other, many other people, we understand that the health of a child, for example, is not just about their genetics and about their access to care, but it's also about their families and their schools and the laws of the land and history and so forth of time. So as we think about health equity, in sort of a big picture, we might ask about maybe civil rights interventions may do something to reduce these inequities. And let me give you some data from a study by Doug Allman. What you have on the y-axis is the postnatal natal infant mortality rate. So as you go up on the y-axis, more babies are dying. On the x-axis, you have historical time from 1946 uh, all the way up through 1974. Now the red line represents the trend lines for white babies. And as you can see, uh, health is improving, right? More ba fewer babies are dying. However, if you look at this, uh, oops, my mouse. Okay, there we go. This green line, this represents the trend line for black babies in Illinois. You can see that there's, there's a disparity in 1946. It widens and it starts to decline right around 1965. Here's Mississippi, black babies in Mississippi. Again, there's a big disparity at baseline in 1946. It widens considerably with a large inflection point right around 1965. Uh, I encourage you to read this paper. It's really well done. Their main conclusion is that this probably represents a causal effect of desegregation of hospitals. And so that's really good news, right? That a hey, uh, big civil rights intervention can have material gains on reducing uh, something like, you know, post neonatal uh, uh, mortality rates. Here's some other data from George Kaplan where they look at life expectancy changes uh, in the decade before 1965 and the decade after 1965. Essentially what this graph is saying is that there's greater improvements in life expectancy for black men and black women, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in that period change and the uh, improvement is greater than that for white men and women, okay. Now, unfortunately, if we take a longer term look at these trends, it's not as rosy as we would hope. So if we actually look at life expectancy from 1900 to 2010, you can see that there's a general trend in improvements in life expectancy for everybody, uh, for black and white Americans in this period. And the red bar is around the 1960s and you don't see that sharp market decline uh, improvement that you saw when we had a more zeroed in shorter uh, time frame. And in fact, if we look at things like heart disease rates, you can see that um, there's actually relative parity between uh, black and white uh, persons from 1965 to about 1975, but then the disparity starts to widen again. So why don't we see these long-term improvements in health equity despite these broad, broad scale societal uh, civil rights interventions? And I think we can draw wisdom from Derek Bell, who said, even these Herculean efforts we hail as successful will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. So in other words, this is essentially saying that the equilibrium of society is inequality. Now, before I get into how we think about this much more structurally, I wanna talk more institutionally. Okay, so, um, you know, right now there's a lot of discussion about racism is a public health crisis and many of the, our professional societies are getting very interested in understanding racism. Um, 
I want to maybe provide a little bit of clarity on the difference between institutional racism and structural racism, because I think they're fundamentally different, and they get at what Derek Bell was trying to say. Now, to talk about institutional racism, we can think of that as discrimination perpetuated by institutions such as housing, medicine, education, law enforcement, the courts, and so forth. So individual institutions can you know, discriminate against people, and we can enact civil rights legislation against specific institutions. So desegregation of hospitals uh, and so forth. Okay, here's one example of uh, discrimination perpetuated by the lending industry. The, and this is the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, HMDA. Basically, this is a, a data set that's a data collection system mandated by Congress in order to monitor uh, civil rights violations in, in lending practices by banks. So of course, for most people, if you want to buy a house, you need to get a mortgage from a bank. And uh, this is one of the ways that actually uh, redlining practices helped uh, uh, maintain residential segregation despite uh, statutes that forbade it, right? So banks would discriminate against uh, minority and, uh, and female lenders. And so uh, a statute was uh, raised, the, hum the HUMDA, which basically mandates that when anybody applies for a bank loan in order to get a mortgage, the bank is required to capture information on the borrower, the applicants, gender, race, and so forth, so as that we can actually monitor whether discrimination is happening. So the HUMDA is a great data set. You can actually go and use it to look at your local Bank of America to see if the, you know, your local branch is discriminating against uh, lenders of various uh, um, uh, uh, statuses. Okay, and so with that, you know, I did a study, this was many years ago, where we were really looking at whether discrimination by lending institutions, uh, also uh, related to, uh, also uh, another measure uh, related to residential segregation were related to health inequalities. So we can do research like this, where we look at specific institutions and the behavior of these institutions. And other people like Mark Katzenbuehler, for example, has done a lovely set of, a series of studies uh, in similar fashion, right? And, you know, as we think about, we have so many different institutions, you know, banking being just one of them. Uh, another important one in the recent landscape has really been the uh, judicial, penal, and uh, law enforcement system. And this has morphed into what, you know, Michelle Alexander has called the new Jim Crow, right? And the idea here is that segregation at the residential level which was outlawed in the 1960s, essentially just morphed. It just transformed. It never left us, but instead of segregating people by residential areas, we're essentially segregating people into prisons, right? And so as health researchers, we could you know, do research on this. We can look at the relationship between the jail, the penal system and so forth and various health outcomes. The problem is that the prison system does not operate in isolation. It is connected to courts and the police, right? And you know, even though today we can have, you know, calls to do civil rights interventions at, say, the police system, and say, you know, we should defund the police or change how they do the work and so forth, that's important. But when you ask yourself why don't we see structural changes uh, by, you know, police officers, and it's partly because they understand that the court system generally has their back, right? We also understand that the police system doesn't operate in isolation. It's also connected to schools, employers, clinics, and so forth. And in a very sobering article that came out in the New York Times uh, about a year or so ago, there was a very interesting article where they were saying that uh, the medical system helps cover up, uh, in some ways, police brutality. Uh, and if you look at a lot of Black men in particular who have died in police custody, uh, essentially the cause of death was cited as sickle cell disease, right? And so there are definitely a lot of questions that uh, arise from this kind of research that deserve to be probed much further, you know, um, how all these different systems are working together to maintain this equilibrium of inequality, right? And so that's why we have language like new Jim Crow, we have, you know, modern racism. It's essentially that racism has never left us. It's just change force, right? And so uh, 
uh, scholars like Barbara Reskin has argued that we can't just think about you know, discrimination perpetuated by individuals. We can't just think about discrimination perpetuated by institutions in isolation. We have to use a more system science approach to understand how these systems all work together. So, um, and one of the ways that we wanna start thinking, I believe as a field is to move beyond individuals, to move beyond institutions, to really start to think about structure. And uh, I'll borrow a definition from Zinzi Bailey, who argues that structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems reflected in history, culture, and interconnected institutions. And this point about interconnections, I think is very critical to our understanding of structural racism. And let me offer an, a metaphor. So this is a buckyball. It's Buckminster Fullerene, 60 carbon atoms arranged like a soccer ball, right? And so each of the little, you know, circles represents a carbon atom. Um, and, you know, it, it's essentially in the shape of a soccer ball. If you think about each atom, each node as representing an institution. So one of the atoms represents housing, another represents law enforcement, a third represents education and so forth. They're all interconnected in this way. Now imagine you have the soccer ball and you kick it. It momentarily, it deflects of course at the uh, point of contact with your foot, but a millisecond later, the ball just kind of reverberates back into that of a sphere. And the reason that happens is the forces that are exerted on that part of the ball essentially gets distributed across the entire structure, right? And I believe that this is a good metaphor for understanding why civil rights interventions have not had durable effects on health and other inequities. And it's because the work of racism, when we intervene on any one of these uh, individual systems, gets morphed and shifted into that of another system. So that's why we have, you know, uh, the new Jim Crow. Um, and so as we think about this, I think it's useful to use a metaphor like a soccer ball or like Buckminster Fullery to understand that our eyes and our intervention should also be drawn towards the connections across these institutions. And so, Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how to think about uh, connections across institutions. And then I'll talk a little bit about something called racialized rules, which transcends uh, these institutions. So we can borrow methods from uh, research uh, on, um, on social network analysis, where we can look at how uh, institutions and actors are connected together. So this is a study of white supremacist networks. And you can see, probably not surprisingly, that neo-Nazi groups are connected to skinhead groups and so forth. But they're also connected to the book industry. They're also connected to music and so forth in order to essentially build a movement. Here's another study where they're looking at right-wing uh, networks uh, in uh, Italy. And again, you can see that neo-Nazis and skinheads are connected together, but they're also co connected to publishers, political parties, music groups, and so forth. You can also take this kind of method and apply it to, for example, who's talking to who on Twitter. So these are individual tweets. Each little uh, red circle represents a person who is tweeting and you can see who is retweeting and connected to them in the sociogram, right? And so the implications I think are, as we move forward as a field to think about structural racism is of course we should continue to think about institutions and institutional behavior, but we should also think more structurally about how these institutions are connected together on, and, you know, through bonds on things such as money, information, the formal contracts and MOUs and so forth across institutions, as well as the informal day-to-day -day practices that essentially become these racialized rules. And I'll talk a little bit about the rules in a second. Okay. This idea of rules is not necessarily a new one. It's been out in the literature, but I don't think we've really thought too hard about what that really means. Eduardo Benito Silva, for example, says racism provides the rules for perceiving and dealing with other people. Chandra Ford and her colleagues have argued that our disciplinary norms and conventions help to reinforce these racial, uh, existing racial and other hierarchies. And so we can talk about this in terms of norms of racial sorting. How do we think about the racial hierarchy that ends up manifesting as implicit biases, as well as our everyday practices. And I'll give one example related to racialized algorithms. So I have a question for all of us. 
uh, as we contemplate this screenshot taken from, you know, uh, the data from the US Census, right? So this is something, of course, we see every day. It's essentially population counts, right? So, you know, how many people are white, black, and so forth. But the question I have is, how are these groups sorted? Is this listed alphabetically? No. Is this listed by population size? No. Is this listed by who was on this land first? No. It's listed by uh, what I believe is our implicit notions of which groups matter in our racial conversation in the United States. And in this case, whites are quite literally on top. We do this every day in our own research. So here's a random table one that I pulled from an article from the American Journal of Public Health. And again, the sample is not sorted alphabetically. It's not sorted by sample size. It's not even sorted by the dependent variable of the vaccine uptake rate, but it's again sorted by this very predictable pattern that we all do on an everyday basis that really essentially reinforces that there is a racial hierarchy um, even in our research um, and things that we all do uh, as researchers. Here's another way it manifests. And what I wanna draw your attention to is the concordance between the title and the data presented on the bar charts, okay? So in this case, the, uh, the title says, African-Americans and Hispanics are most likely to be uninsured. And when you look at the bar charts, indeed, African-Americans and Hispanics have the highest rates of uninsurance. Here's another one. Hispanics and African-Americans are most likely to be uh, feel treated with disrespect. And again, the groups that um, have the highest rates of feeling disrespected are African-Americans and Hispanics. Now take a look at this graph where it says minorities are less confident that they will receive good quality of care. What's interesting here, of course, is that Asians and Hispanics are the groups that are the least confident. If we were to use parallel sentence structure, given what we saw before, this title should have said Asian Americans and Hispanics are the least confident. And again, in this case, here's a graph on satisfaction with quality of care. The groups again that are the least satisfied are Asian and Hispanics, but now there's even no call out about race. And I think part of what's going on here is that there's a discomfort with this idea that, wow, we're not, we don't have this bipolar understanding of race anymore, where we automatically think that African Americans are the worst off and groups like Asians who are presumed to be a model minority are not the worst off. Um, I think when we have little slips uh, like this, it does a disservice both to the black community because it presumes that they're always the worst off, but that's not always the case, nor should it be always the case. And it also does a disservice to the Asian American community where any possible concerns related to inequities and so forth end up being erased. Here's some additional data that's a little bit more recent. Uh, related to um, COVID data. And of course, you know, take all the numbers with a grain of salt because of course COVID numbers are always changing. But as you can see from this call out in the bar chart that accompanies it, it basically says overall black, Hispanic and Asian patients had higher rates of infection. And the bar charts of course comport with that. Now, if you look at this next part, the language shifts to people of color. Now, if you look at the graph, uh, related to hospitalization, related to COVID, and risk of death related to COVID. Actually, the group, according to these data, that's worse off are Asians. So again, we have these real subtle changes in language when the data don't seem to fit our implied notions of the racial hierarchy. It plays itself out in other ways. So here's a study uh, looking at environmental exposures amongst children. There's a survey to parents and the parents are asked to talk about the race of the child, which is written down verbatim. Uh, and it asks the two questions that are you know, pretty uh, standard practice in a lot of ways. Now, the researchers are trying to grapple with what to do about multiracial children. And they decided to adopt the one drop rule. So basically, if a child was black and Korean, the child was coded as black in the uh, data set. If the child was Korean and Cuban, the child was coded as Hispanic. And then if the child was Korean and white, the child was then coded as Asian and so forth. The thing with this kind of methodology is that it can play unintended mischief. Um, so if you continue to read the article, later on in the, uh, they, they, they write this, compared to the general population in the Bay Area, our sample had greater representation of Hispanics and Blacks and fewer Asians. Well, 
you know, this was kind of built into your SAS code, right? Because essentially the investigators kind of built this in as they start to make these decision rules on how to code uh, participants. And so here we're literally introducing racial bias into the research. Um, and this leads to a broader conversation about racialized algorithms. Certainly medicine has been having a long conversation about this uh, fairly, well, uh, a deep conversation about this fairly recently. These algorithms are in many fields of research like cardiology and endocrinology and so forth. And let me kind of give you a little bit of the history of one, uh, one of these metrics related to spirometry. And there's a great book by Lundy Braun, uh, which I would encourage you to read if you haven't seen it. Okay, so we have a spirometer, and if you actually look, there is an African ethnic correction factor built right into the appendix of the user's manual. And so if the patient is black, you know, you input you know, all these parameters, and it by default corrects, if you will, the uh, estimate by, you know, in this case, 0.88. Now, I think it's important to understand the origins of this practice. And I wanna go back to 1851 to Samuel Cartwright, who was a physician. And he wrote, it's not only a difference, uh, it's not only in the skin that a difference of color exists between the Negro and the white man, but in the membranes, the muscles, the tendons, and all the fluids and secretions. The reason for these differences is founded on unalterable physiological laws. So he was saying unambiguously, that black babies are biological, uh, black bodies are biologically different than white bodies. And this wasn't just stated neutrally, this was actually used to justify slavery because he would later write, he would also write, under the compulsive power of the white man, they, black slaves, are made to labor or exercise, which makes the lungs perform the duty of vitalizing the blood more perfectly. So to understand what he's trying to say here, you have to understand the thinking of the time was that you know, black bodies are constitutionally inferior to white bodies and left to their own devices, black people would ultimately degenerate and kill themselves off, right? And so in this case, and it's because essentially according to that twisted logic, you know, black people are lazy and so forth. And so what they need is a white uh, a slave owner, which will make them exercise and therefore extend their life expectancy and so forth. Absolutely twisted logic, but certainly this was part of the thinking at the time. But here we understand that there's a connection now between race and lung capacity, right? Um, and this kind of thinking started to permeate into other fields, uh, many fields of medicine and research. Here's the article uh, published in JAMA related to the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. And here we're starting to see statistical language. First, talking about you know, uh, black differences in syphilis, the language is there's a racial influence, a lessened threshold value for symptoms. So now we're starting to think about the inflection points on a graph and all those kinds of things that start to lead us to think about all these different kinds of adjustments. We can see these adjustments, for example, in data in NHANES. So if you wanted to use data from the uh, NHANES data set, there are racial, age, gender, and all kinds of other correction factors. Uh, here's a study where they're trying to create these correction factors for creatinine uh, excretions. Um, and what's interesting is if you read the language of the people who put this article correct, uh, this together, it's really interesting. <clears throat> okay, so they wrote, a racial correction factor is introduced to account for the higher lean body mass and creatinine excretion rate of non-Hispanic black participants, but no factor if needed, is available for other NHANES ethnicity groupings, for example, Mexican-American and other Hispanic adults and children. Ethnicity like race is self-reported and alone is not expected to have a major influence on musculature. Now, if you found this convoluted and confusing, it's because it is. And I think what's going on is the uh, investigators realize they have a logical problem here. You know, they're saying, hey, you know, we need to do these correction flag factors for black people but we probably don't need to do it, need to do it for Mexican Americans and ethnicity and like, like race, they're self-reported and shouldn't have a major influence on musculature, but it does for black people. And so it's really confusing and convoluted. Um, and I think it's because they 
at the back of their minds know that they don't actually have a good answer, right? These correction factors end up being published, they're used. Um, and in this case, if you look at their study, this 0.18b is essentially the correction factor if the NHANES participant is black, because it comes built into a very fancy looking equation, people can understandably decide that this is truthful and based on really rigorous research. However, if you go to this article and you look at the citation screen, that 0.18 was not, came from another paper that was not designed to look at black white differences rigorously. It was just actually a covariate that they happened to publish and these authors ended up just plucking it and sticking it into their own equation. So it's not even based on the best uh, practices in science. These correction factors abound not only in research and medicine, but they're everywhere. They're in targeted advertising, judicial awards, and we'll talk about that, face recognition technology and so forth. And I would draw your attention to Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression. A couple of months ago, uh, to give you an example of this, a couple of months ago, I took, uh, I went to Google Images and I wrote down the word professor and this is what got returned, right? The images of who a professor is uh, don't mirror many of the people uh, probably on this webinar, right? And in fact, other research is showing that these algorithms uh, are showing up everywhere, uh, including in the billing systems of uh, HMOs and so forth. And I would draw your attention to a really great paper by Obermeyer published in Science a few year, years ago. So let me start to pull some of these things together. And in order to do that, I do wanna go back again in history to 1896 uh, to a book published by Frederick Hoffman, who was a statistician working for potential life insurance. Now in 1896, he published this 300 page volume on racial traits and tendencies of the American Negro. And it's table after table. He has mortality rate ratios and so forth, vital statistics. He has economic values. He's even essentially looking at neighborhood effects, if you will. What's really, really remarkable is given the time Basically, they had to calculate all these things by hand. There were no computers. There were no central databases where we could just go to the US Census Bureau and download this stuff. They actually had to compile everything. 300 pages essentially documenting what's going on uh, you know, with uh, various groups in the United States. This was done for policy purposes. Uh, because Prudential ended up sending a statement like this to their black policyholders. <clears throat> and this is what they wrote. The sum payment assured will be one third less than now granted for the same weekly premium. These changes are made in consequence of the excess mortality in the class above name, i.e. black shareholder policyholders. They do not apply to other persons. So essentially what this is saying is that Prudential was telling their black policyholders, well, you know what? Because black people tend to die more, if you happen to die and you're a Prudential customer, we're gonna pay you less than we will pay our white shareholders. And uh, by the way, we're not gonna change your premium, but this is what we're gonna do, right? So these numbers that are being calculated by you know, statisticians, actuarials, et cetera, actually have real consequences uh, on economic uh, outcomes, and this passes on intergenerationally in this case. Uh, the people, th this is a conundrum that continues today. Um, and uh, before you kind of look at this slide, let me tell you a little bit of, uh, of what happens in judicial awards, right? So imagine you have a child who dies due to say a car crash or something like that. And the uh, defendant now has to pay um, the, uh, the plaintiff, right? So how much do we pay out the parents of a child who died due to a car crash? And so judges will turn to an actuarial, they'll turn to a forensic economist who typically calculates for the expected future earnings. So essentially, well, you know, here's a child. If they were to survive to 65, this is plausibly what they might make over this lifetime. And therefore that's what we should be, we should be paying out to the parents. 
Okay. Now the problem is then people might end up using a racial and a gender adjustment factor. So in other words, like, oh, well, you know, women make 75, let's assume that it's a white boy who dies, we'll pay out a million dollars. But instead, let's assume a different person that it's a, a woman. Well, women make 75 cents to the dollar that a man makes. So instead of paying out a million dollars to the parents, we'll only pay out $750,000. Oh, but you know what? The person who died is a black girl. Well, black women make around on average 65 cents to the dollar. So instead of paying out a million dollars that we would to, a, to the parents of a white boy, we would only pay out 650,000 to the parents of a black girl, right? And so, the people who create these estimates that are used in court settlements and so forth uh, include forensic economists. And so uh, they did a survey of the of these very uh, of, of this very, um, you know, of, of these forensic economists. And they said, OK, assume you're assuming the economic loss of a two year old black boy. What data would you use to make your estimate? Well, about 48 percent would only use gender. Half a percent would use only race, but about 45% or so would use both race and gender. And only about 8% would not use these data at all. Okay. There was a qualitative section to the same study. And one of the uh, economists wrote, it's her role to be scientists and to bring to bear the best available data. To fail to use gender and race specific data is to make political correctness more important than science. So their argument is, yeah, you know, we should do these race and gender corrections. We should pay out black girls less than, than white boys because that's just what the data tell us to do. But not everybody agrees. So here's another forensic economist who wrote, I would only use the data for white males as the, they are the only cohort that did not suffer any past gender or racial bias in hiring, et cetera, and consequently not continue the negative impact of racial and gender bias, right? So these practices of these racial correction factors have real consequences uh, intergenerationally. And it's not even a given within that profession to use these or not use these. These are essentially not only scientific issues, but they are ethical and moral issues as well. Um, the Washington Post, for example, uh, did some work looking at the compensation that was lost uh, to people of color. And in this case, you can see that uh, the, uh, the projection, the compensation offered to black males uh, with a high school degree were less than that of white males. And again, these are for these court settlements. And again, this holds for many level, all different levels of education, and it holds across um, uh, gender as well. So these racial, whoops, these racial correction factors are used in many industries. They're used in medicine, they're used in uh, life insurance uh, settlements, et cetera. We, many of us will create vital statistics which are then used in these policies which then contribute to inequalities in wealth and health, okay? So really to pull this together, to think about some considerations related to interventions and so forth, right? Um, one, we need to stop and think about the racialized rules that we all adhere to when we construct things like table one and how we order um, just which groups are presented. Um, this plays out in our research when uh, I've been on uh, NIH review committees and I'm sure many of you as well, where people have argued, oh, well, you know, if we, have a sample that's only comprised of, uh, you know, Latinx people. Uh, it's not as good as if we had a white comparison group. But in many instances, a white comparison group is not needed and may even be counterproductive, right? Um, it's also present in all these algorithms that we use, all these correction factors that we use in uh, various, you know, fields of medicine, various fields of research. Um, they're everywhere. And uh, as we move into more sophisticated forms of AI, uh, it's really something to, for all of us to be uh, highly concerned about. Certainly, we need to con continue to intervene at the person level uh, to do interventions on things like implicit biases, as Dr. Cooper has eloquently shown us. Um, 
But at the same time, we also have to intervene at the institutional level, monitor uh, violations of civil rights by organizations uh, like banks and schools and medicine. Unfortunately, uh, to my knowledge, the Hamda is one of a kind. I am not aware of any other congressionally mandated data systems that are uh, designed to monitor civil rights, but it would be amazing to create a Hamda for say education and medicine. Finally, we need to intervene at the structural level. And by this, I mean really thinking about the connections across institutions, what flows across them, the practices uh, that are done both formally and every day. And so, so in order, and so in closing, um, you know, as we think about the various kinds of racisms that are out there, it's really important to think about the structural racism, which I think is the new frontier of research. And even a buckyball is a little bit too simplistic. Here's an endohedral fullerene that is buckyballs situated within buckyballs. And so um, I'll conclude here. I welcome your questions at the end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Gee. And yes, let me remind everyone to go ahead and put your questions. I see some coming in to the Q&A. Please go ahead and put them in now. And again, we will, we will deal with the questions as part of our panel discussion in about 40 minutes or so. But next, it is my pleasure to introduce Dean Schillinger. Dr. Schillinger is a primary care physician, a public health expert, and professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Schlinger is a leader in health disparities research and is considered one of the founders of the field of health literacy and precision communication in medicine. Please take us forward, Dr. Schillinger. Thank you, Michael. I will share my screen. <clears throat> Is the screen working now? Yes, it is. Terrific. Yes. So uh, the title of my talk is Precision Communication, Implications for Clinical Care, Public Health, and Health Equity. Um, I have uh, no conflicts uh, to disclose. Um, the roadmap today is uh, I'm going to focus on a, a construct called precision communication, which is an approach to promote health by aligning the attributes of health communications the messenger, the strategy, the content, the form, the positionality, and the medium with the characteristics, preferences, and needs of specific audiences. And I'm going to apply this construct uh, to two types of communication. One is uh, clinical communication, um, part of uh, Dr. Cooper's talk, uh, where I will uh, share some results of a study we did in which we applied computational linguistics in an attempt to advance individual health literacy. Specifically, we developed and validated new measures of patients' individual health literacy and clinicians' measures of linguistic complexity uh, as a means to explore whether or not language concordance, linguistic concordance, and tailoring in the form of precision communication is beneficial to patients with respect to understanding uh, their clinician and explore whether or not um, uh, efforts to improve uh, linguistic concordance have implications for health disparities. Second, we will talk about uh, public health communication. I will give a, another example uh, from work uh, we've been doing uh, to harness the arts to advance a form of public health literacy uh, as I explain uh, some of the, uh, the content from the Bigger Picture project. Here, the project's goal is to communicate uh, to the general public uh, the socioecological model of health uh, as a means to advance health equity. And we'll specifically, while much of that work had been around diabetes, we'll specifically talk about an adaptation we recently did related to the COVID pandemic. So I'll start by uh, talking about individual health literacy, which is what I was asked to present on. Uh, this has been defined as the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make informed health decisions. Um, this construct of individual health literacy is most commonly thought of as uh, being comprised of three domains, health literacy in the oral uh, speaking and listening domains, uh, the written as in reading and writing uh, health content domain, and the numerical or quantitative uh, health literacy domain. Increasingly, we've uh, 
become aware that there is also a form of digital health literacy. If you just think about um, the ubiquity now of patient portals uh, as a means to uh, receive care and engage in communication with clinicians and medical homes, the electronic patient portal has become uh, extremely dominant um, with an accelerated phase during the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, in line with uh, Dr. Gee's talks and Dr. Cooper's talk today, uh, many of us have uh, begun to shift the focus of the uh, definitions around health literacy as a fixed capacity to thinking more of health literacy as a balance or imbalance, as the case may be, uh, between the, the capacity and preparedness of the patient and, and family and caregivers um, uh, in relation to the communication demands that we as individual clinicians or we as healthcare systems and institutions place on patients and families. And that um, much of the work uh, in uh, attempting to uh, remedy issues related to limited health literacy have to do with self-reflection and influencing the uh, uh, structures and behaviors of the institutions that uh, deliver care. And this is where the construct of health literate healthcare, healthcare organizations uh, has arisen. Uh, this construct of health literate healthcare organizations was uh, popularized uh, in a recent National Academy of Medicine uh, workshop series related to defining the attributes of health literate healthcare organizations. Now, what do we know about the relationship between individual level health literacy and health disparities? Well, of course, we know that limited health literacy is more common amongst marginalized and minoritized populations. And studies have explored uh, the degree to which health literacy may be a partial explanatory variable with respect to uh, health disparities in uh, disease outcomes. Um, with respect to research exploring educational disparities, um, health literacy has been shown to be at least a partial explanatory variable in such outcomes as self-rated health, receipt of preventive services, health-related skills, functional status, and outcomes of diabetes. With respect to extant racial and ethnic disparities, uh, health literacy has been shown in so some studies to be a partial explanatory variable in such outcomes as self-rated health, receipt of flu shots, blood sugar control in people with diabetes, uh, ability to medication dose uh, accurately, uh, the stage at which uh, individuals with prostate cancer uh, present, and asthma-related quality of life. And with respect to linguistic disparities, it has been shown that the combination of limited English proficiency and limited health literacy appear to be synergistic in terms of being detrimental to healthcare outcomes. However, um, apropos of um, Dr. Gee's uh, speech about the, uh, the mismeasurement of uh, race, ethnicity, and related constructs and the dangers of uh, attribution therein, uh, this body of research, I think, has been subject to a number of limitations. Um, first of all, uh, in uh, studies that uh, uh, attempt to measure the degree to which health literacy is an explanatory mediating variable between a social determinant of health and a distal health outcome, uh, we have to remind ourselves that there is a significant risk of residual confounding. Uh, more importantly, there is significant risk of attribution bias, wherein uh, health literacy may simply be a marker or proxy for other more upstream uh, indicators of marginalization. There are significant concerns regarding uh, bias in measurement, the ways we measure health literacy at an individual level uh, is uh, likely confounded by differences in uh, how we uh, uh, imagine and speak about health constructs. And lastly, attention uh, bias is always a risk. Now, in contrast, a, uh, another construct related to health literacy has arisen uh, known as public health literacy. Um, and this is very much in line with the uh, so socioecological models that uh, both Dr. Cooper and Dr. Gee referenced in their talks. Public health literacy, which I think we've learned quite a bit about during the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, has been defined as the degree to which individuals and groups can obtain, process, understand, evaluate, and act upon information needed to make public health decisions that benefit the community. And of course, these decisions that we make as a society will have a tremendous uh, downstream implications with respect to health equity or health inequity. 
Um, the uh, target populations for efforts to increase public health literacy are the general public. The purpose is to improve the health of the public rather than the individual. The aims are to engage more stakeholders in public health and prevention efforts and to address, to address the determinants of health and the determinants of health behaviors. Um, and it's a really a multidimensional construct that has conceptual foundations rooted in the socio-ecological model, the development of critical thinking skills, and an orientation around uh, uh, civic engagement and equity. Now, thinking about these two uh, forms of health literacy, one can begin to consider a novel framework that could unify uh, conceptually the pathways that might connect social determinants of health with health literacy and health disparities. So here I, I uh, provide a simplified uh, conceptual framework. Uh, the pathways on your left reflect health public health literacy pathways, and those on the right reflect individual health literacy pathways. So on the left, um, keeping in mind uh, the existing health disparities um, uh, as of 2023, you can imagine that those who are more marginalized uh, may have limited structural resources on the one hand and much greater degree of life course exposures, negative health exposures and risks on the other hand that interact with uh, uh, an individual and a population's health literacy uh, at a socioecological uh, level uh, to have uh, health consequences. And the degree to which we can affect the resource allocation in society and the risk of exposures among uh, uh, subpopulations by eliminating uh, marginalization altogether uh, will affect the extent of health inequities and the general population health. On the right side, um, at the individual health literacy level, um, the degree to which healthcare uh, organizations have redesigned themselves to be more health literate, to be able to uh, develop the kinds of relationships that Dr. Uh, Cooper described uh, with their patients and have the kind of institutional commitment uh, to diversity, equity, and uh, health disparity reduction, um, will influence and the degree to which that healthcare is accessible and of high quality will interact with an individual's health, health literacy in a dynamic way to also have health consequences, particularly when we're thinking about populations that have chronic illness. Now, if we just focus on the right side pathway uh, and, and focus on the dyad, as Dr. Otto uh, asked me to remind us, um, we can begin to see what a uh, health literate healthcare organization will enable with respect to clinician patient uh, dyadic relationship and communication. So understanding that a patient and clinician come together in the midst of uh, existing social and environmental conditions, you'll see on the left that um, the patient and their caregiver and the clinicians enter the relationship with a number of communication characteristics, including but not limited to the health literacy of the patient and the communication style and linguistic complexity of the clinician. Uh, together, the actors uh, enter into a communication dance that has to do with uh, elicitation and explanation. If you think about a clinician's task in the 20 minute, 15 to 20 minute encounter, it is to elicit and to explain in response to that elicitation. And the goal is to arrive at a, a kind of shared meaning, um, a, a mind meld between the clinician and patient around four domains of disease management. The state of the disease, so how is your heart failure doing? The barriers you have with treatment, what are some of the problems you're having adhering to the diet or the, or the medication regimen? Um, how is your mood? Is that getting in the way? Are you depressed? Um, Concordance and shared meaning around the diagnosis. Are we seeing eye to eye on what the nature of the problem is and do you understand that problem? And are we seeing eye to eye with respect to the treatment plan? And that only by arriving at shared meaning can we as clinicians and patients be assured that our clinical decision-making is optimized. And through that shared meaning, can we have a hope 
that we can build the kind of trusting relationship uh, and kind of communication that can promote, although not guarantee, but promote treatment adherence. And together, by good clinical decision making and treatment adherence, we can achieve health outcomes, uh, understanding that all of these outcomes are subject to the contingencies of the social and environmental conditions in which the patient returns to when they leave the office. So for the rest of this part of the talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the importance of arriving at shared meaning as a goal for health literate healthcare organizations and the implications that that might have for health disparities. Um, and I am moving forward in this regard um, by tipping my hat to uh, Dr. Stephen Cole and Richard Frankel, who have defined this three function approach to relationship centered care, very much aligned with uh, Dr. Cooper's uh, work, which is known as the three C's that in a 15 or 20 minute visit, our goal as clinicians is primarily to connect with a patient, to co-construct the problem with the patient, and to collaborate with the patient around subsequent action, to connect, to co-construct and collaborate. And you can imagine how important then with these three functions in mind is arriving at shared meaning. How can you co-construct if you have different understandings of the problem? How can you collaborate around treatment plans if you have different conceptions of the solution? So I'm gonna share with you now um, some findings from uh, uh, the Eclipse Project, which was funded by the National Library of Medicine, and it stands for Employing Computational Linguistics to Improve Patient Provider Secure Exchanges. This is work on the patient portal that I referred to earlier. Now, um, the rationale for the Eclipse Project is that the goal of precision medicine, a very important NIH initiative, is to, quote, enable providers to tailor treatment and prevention strategies to people's unique characteristics. And the majority of precision medicine research has involved the tailoring of treatments to people's unique genetic makeup, their microbiome composition, et cetera. Um, and it has required incorporating different types of so-called big data from genomics to metabolomics to the microbiome to try to advance the construct of precision medicine. Now, despite the centrality of communication to health and healthcare, little empirical quantitative research has examined clinician level skills and styles that influence patient outcomes. Dr. Cooper shared with you uh, some of that research, but relative to the kinds of research we've been seeing on how, for example, cells communicate with each other, relatively little research has gone on. And in fact, no research has analyzed so-called big linguistic data derived from clinicians and patients communic communication exchanges to advance precision medicine through precision communication. So um, as we discussed, health literacy is an important part of disease management and uh, perhaps no more important than in diabetes. And health literacy helps patients and providers achieve mutual understanding or shared meaning, this co-constructing and collaborating. Um, however, it is not known how often physicians use complex language that might be especially problematic for patients with limited health literacy and get in the way of achieving shared meaning. We know from prior research that in the context of diabetes, patients with inadequate health literacy are much more likely to experience poor quality communication uh, with their physician, uh, with their doctor using words that they don't understand or doctors giving them test results without sufficient explanation, et cetera. Um, and uh, the question is, are there physician skills and behaviors that can be brought to bear that can be particularly beneficial for individuals with limited health literacy? Now, the digital communication revolution is upon us. Electronic health records are ubiquitous. Patient portals are penetrating every health system. It occupies much of my time now as a primary care physician. And communication sensitive chronic conditions like diabetes require between visit communication. And so patients and clinicians are now communicating through patient portals via the secure messaging function. This does require a certain level of digital health literacy, but we are seeing rapid uptake even among populations with limited health literacy skills. To date, no research has employed computational linguistics in an attempt to try to measure health literacy indirectly by directly analyzing patients' language, or similarly measure physicians' linguistic complexity by directly analyzing their language. 
Now, this research is challenging. Health literacy is a complex construct. Its measurement is time consuming. So we're trying to pioneer the use of computational linguistics. And here I'm talking about NLP and machine learning to develop and validate a novel set of health literacy measures, uh, both at the patient and physician level attempting to harness so-called big data at a very granular level from electronic patient portals. It requires a large amount of data transfer, as you can imagine, a lot of cleaning and confirmatory linguistics and health services research. And it, we're, in a sense, doing both the basic, basic science of communication as well as translational research, and it really has required a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration with people who are much smarter than I am. Um, now, why an eclipse? So here we're talking about the constructs of health literacy and shared meaning. These are simply that, they're constructs, and we don't really know how to truly represent them and how to truly measure them. And so the metaphor here is we are down on earth and we are trying to measure health literacy, which I will say here is, the, the, the analogy is it's the sun. We're trying to study the sun, understand the shape of the sun, measure its contents, its temperature, its size, its shape. Um, but the only way we can do that measurement of truth, the sun, is we can't look at the sun directly. We just, we are not God, our eyes are sensitive, and so we must do it when we are obstructed by the moon. The moon, when it puts the sun in eclipse, gives us the possibility of looking around the margins to try to measure truth, to measure the shape and size and temperature of the sun. And what we get when we do that measurement is we're looking at the shadows and the reflections and the penumbra of the sun. We can't directly look at the sun as we try to study it. And this to a certain extent represents the scientific process in general. Let's now make the analogy clear with respect to the eclipse project. So the sun here is health literacy. We're trying to measure health literacy at the patient level. We're doing it through the filter, through the eclipse of the language that patients and physicians are using. Those are our specimens. The tools and methods that we're applying to measure health literacy are natural language processing linguistic indices. These are uh, tools that have been developed to measure pieces of language as they arise in patients and physicians' uh, communications. Um, we then, as we're standing on earth, applying these linguistic indices to the language to try to measure health literacy, we then attempt to validate what we are seeing in the shadow of the eclipse against other measures we're, we're taking. So in our case, in the eclipse project, we have on the bottom health indices, people's blood pressure control, their hemoglobin A1C, their diabetes control. And on the top, people's self-report of their communication with their physician. I, I could understand my physician perfectly well, not so well, with great difficulty, et, et cetera. And this is the overview of how we carried out the Eclipse project. Our first aim was to employ natural language processing to assess secure message content generated by English speaking patients with diabetes and their clinicians in an attempt to develop and validate novel automated measures of patients' health literacy and physicians' linguistic complexity and to measure the content and predictive validity of those measures against patient self-report of doctor's communication and patient's health outcomes and utilization of care. The second aim was once we had these novel measures, we wanted to de determine whether concordance or matching between physician's linguistic complexity and patient's health literacy might be associated with better communication outcomes and better health outcomes. So first, we developed the automatically generated health literacy profiles based on distinct theoretical models and associated uh, NLP and machine learning techniques. We had a million secure messages exchanged between over 12,000 ethnically diverse diabetes patients receiving care from over 33,000 primary care physicians in an integrated health system. This was Kaiser of Northern California. We merged these data with detailed survey and clinical data that we had previously collected on this on a cohort, a subset, with measures of self-reported health literacy and scores of their physician's communication based on the CAP survey. At the end of the day, we had over 400,000 secure messages involving 7,000 English-speaking patients who were quite ethnically diverse. 
uh, and a little over a thousand primary care physicians. We then uh, cleaned the, this language and we um, um, employed the following um, examples of natural language processing indices in an attempt to quantify and analyze their language. We applied standard machine learning methods that I won't go into here in an attempt to understand the degree to which these linguistic indices were associated with uh, patient self-reported health literacy, as well as expert rated health literacy of a subset of secure messages. We discovered that um, our novel measures uh, were quite predictive of a directly measured uh, health literacy with areas under the curve that were um, quite impressive actually. Um, interestingly, we wanted to ensure that the prediction of health literacy, the health literacy estimate in terms of its accuracy and content validity would not significantly vary by race ethnicity. And we found very similar performance of the automated health literacy uh, measure across uh, race and ethnicity in our sample. Similarly, we wanted to determine whether the automated measure of health literacy was, as one would predict, associated with important outcomes in this sample. Physician communication ratings, uh, poor medication adherence as measured by claims data, uh, episodes of hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, um, uh, representing uh, a problem that we see more commonly in diabetes patients with uh, limited health literacy, poor diabetes control, and greater utilization of care. And what we found in, in purple here is that overall for the total sample, uh, we found quite consistently that our measure of limited health literacy uh, through the um, computational linguistics method was associated with uh, worse patterns of health outcomes compared to those with adequate health literacy. And that this pattern, the point estimates were fairly similar, uh, if not always statistically significant, always over uh, the odds ratio of one across different racial and ethnic groups. So um, a similar, I should say, a similar process uh, we applied to develop the physician's linguistic complexity measure. So once we had a valid health literacy measure, and a valid physician's measure of linguistic complexity, we moved on to aim two, which was to identify um, if physicians use concordant or discordant language with their patients. So do the patients vary, and specifically, do patients vary in their ratings of how well they understand their physician as a function of that physician's linguistic complexity? And if so, does that variance depend on patient's health literacy. In other words, is uh, linguistic concordance particularly important for patients who have limited health literacy? In addition, we, in addition to studying the dyad, we wanted to identify whether physicians have certain communication tailoring styles or strategies based on the extent to which they achieve concordance across all of their patients. Since many of these uh, physicians had a number of patients in the sample, we were able to look across their patients and identify tailoring strategies uh, that physicians may employ. And so we asked the question, do certain physician communication strategies result in patients reporting better understanding? So first we gathered all the physician patient pairs in the sample by aggregating the secure messages. So here we have physician A on the left. Uh, she has three unique patients uh, on the right and they each are generating written content as they exchange thousands and thousands of secure messages over this uh, uh, large sample. So we, in this uh, sample, we had a little over 1,100 primary care physicians, 4,300 unique patients. Physicians had between one and 18 patients, an average of about four patients. And physicians sent over 100,000 secure messages and patients sent over 100,000 secure messages. And uh, some of these were of significant length and which enabled us to carry out our computational linguistic analyses. So then for each patient, we generated their health literacy score. 
applying the computational linguistics indices that I showed you earlier, the NLP indices, we were able to classify patients as either having high or low health literacy. Similarly, for each physician, we were able to generate a linguistic complexity score for them at the dyad level and are able to de define them as having high or low linguistic complexities. So here you see um, some dyads. Physician A has low complexity uh, uh, communication when she is communicating with patient one who also has low health literacy. So that is a concordant dyad. Um, similarly, a high complexity physician communicating with a high health literacy patient has concordant communication. And finally, a high complexity physician and a low health literacy patient are having discordant communication. Here are the, the combinations that one can achieve with concordant and discordant between patient and physician. So first onto results, let's talk about the distribution of language concordance for all physician-patient pairs. So first we found that among patients with high health literacy, a majority, 56%, were communicating with physicians who also used high complexity language. Um, however, in 44% of the cases, high health literacy patients were subject to communication from a physician who used low complexity language. In contrast, patients with low health literacy um, had a concordant, uh, concordance was achieved not 56% of the time, but 47% of the time in which their physician was using low complexity. And in 53% of the time, they were communicating subject to a physician who was communicating with high complexity. Now we ask the question, does dyadic concordance track with patients' ratings of understanding their doctors? And re remember these ratings, these CAP scores are obtained at a completely different time and place and have to do with physician, uh, patients' ratings of their doctor's overall communication skills and experiences, not necessarily how they're communicating on a patient portal. What we found was for low health literacy patients only, having a discordant physician was associated with significantly worse understanding of their physician. There was a 40% greater odds of having poor understanding of your physician if you had limited health literacy and your physician uh, used high complexity language. This was not the case for patients with high health literacy. For patients with high health literacy, it did not appear to be important whether the physician used high or low complexity language. Now you will note here that when we compared the odds ratio uh, uh, for non-white uh, individuals with white individuals, we found that um, there was uh, a lower likelihood of poorer understanding if one was a white patient. And this was true in both unadjusted and this fully adjusted model. In other words, achieving concordance did not eliminate the extant disparities that Dr. Cooper described existing with respect to, for example, Black, Latinx, and API populations in their general reports of understanding of their physician. So while concord achieving concordance was helpful for patients with uh, all patients with limited health literacy, it did not appear to mitigate extant health disparities in communication. Still is important, but does not uh, appear to eliminate extant disparities. Now we wanted to ask, okay, we understand that at the dyad level it's important, but are those doctors somehow different? Are do doctors different in how they tailor and match across their patients? And is that an additional influence on patients' understanding? So to do this, we have to generate tailing signatures, um, measuring physician's tendency to adapt across the patient set. And people can do this in a couple of ways. Um, you may have heard of the uh, term using universal precautions in the communication literature. And that refers to, you can't assume that your patient has high or, or low health literacy, so you should always use low complexity language as a universal precaution. So here's a physician who by and large 
is using universal precautions. For most of his patients who have low health literacy, he's using low complexity language in blue. And for most of his patients with high health literacy, he's also using low complexity in blue. And that's generally the recommended communication strategy in the health literacy literature is to always use universal precautions. But you might have physicians who are more attuned to their patients and their patients' use of language in which they are universally tailoring. Here you see a, a woman physician who is using lower complexity language with most of her low health literacy patients. And, if, and she is using mostly high complexity language with her high health literacy patients. And so we were interested in determining whether or not universal precautions or universal tailoring might be important for uh, patients' understanding and engagement in care. So for each physician, we were able to rank them on the degree to which they approximated universal tailoring or universal precautions patterns. So what did we find with respect to the relationship between tailoring and ratings of understanding? We found that the universal tailoring communication strategy, the one in which the physician is attuned to the language of their patient listening carefully and adapting her language to match that of the patient was independently associated with better communication uh, entire, across the entire cohort. Yet again, if you look at the race covariate, um, this did not eliminate the extant disparity that we saw uh, between uh, minoritized uh, patients and, and uh, versus white patients in terms of uh, communication scores but appear to uh, operate equally well across race, race, ethnicity, but not to eliminate disparities. We found no positive effect, no benefit for the use of universal precautions. Rather, it was the universal tailoring strategy that appeared to be beneficial. Lastly, we were interested in, is there a synergistic effect? We discovered that linguistic concordance, as, as I showed earlier, with a doctor mattered for low health literacy patients. We discovered that doctors themselves can vary on their overall strategies and that universal tailoring matters for all patients. But what if you combine the two? We found a statistically significant interaction between diet level concordance and physicians tailoring scores. Patients with limited health literacy significantly benefited when they are in a concordant patient physician relationship and their doctor tends to use a tailoring signature that resembles, you guessed it, universal tailoring. Patients whose physician uh, matches their uh, language uh, complexity and does so across all of their patients had the best outcomes. In fact, there were no more disparities between high and low health literacy patients in their communication ratings if the physician achieved concordance in the dyad and across their uh, patients tended towards universal tailoring. So for this phase of the talk, our conclusions are that um, the Eclipse project was the first to harness big linguistic data to develop and validate measures of patient health literacy and physician linguistic complexity using computational linguistics. Uh, thinking about this in relation to Dr. Cooper's talk, this is just sort of a reductionist approach to the overarching discussion she had about relationship-centered care and communication. This is just one specific attribute of communication, which is the achievement of linguistic concordance in the hopes of achieving shared meaning. It was the first quantitative study to provide evidence that a precision medicine approach tailoring to the needs of the individual patient can generate benefits and that patients both receptive and expressive skills individually and in, in combination can influence communication outcomes. Patients with low health literacy were particularly sensitive to linguistic matching and patients of both low and high health literacy benefit from physicians with this adaptive language style. And insofar as uh, marginalized populations are more likely to be subject to low health literacy, this is an important uh, intervention from a public health standpoint, but does not or will not be anticipated to eliminate extant disparities in communication uh, as that Dr. Cooper described. We concluded that precision communication can promote shared meaning for all and certainly reduces or eliminates health literacy related disparities across race ethnicity. 
and that the construct of precision medicine must then include the domain of precision communication. Now, that concludes the part of my talk that had to do with individual health literacy and precision communication. I'm now going to move to the public health literacy uh, and precision communication part of my talk. Here, I'm going to talk about a campaign that um, uh, our team co-created with uh, a, uh, a community-based organization called Youth Speaks um, called the Bigger Picture Campaign, in which we harness um, youth voices and specifically voices from youth artists of color to advance public health literacy. The project um, has uh, was recently awarded um, a non-communicable disease prize from the World Health Organization for our work in the prevention and control of type two diabetes, which is now an epidemic in young people of color. Uh, but I'm gonna share with you today um, to make sure that it really resonates in the current day, uh, share with you the work that we've been doing in the context of the COVID pandemic and specifically the campaign that these young people created around COVID vaccination. And I want you to think about this idea of precision communication as you uh, watch some of this content. Now, why are we doing this? Um, uh, we put out recently in the American Journal of Public Health a framework for how social media can influence public health. Um, and again, having lived through the COVID pandemic, we all recognize the ways in which social media uh, can influence uh, public health. And here um, for the Bigger Picture Project, we were interested in looking at the um, attributes of the communication itself, um, as well as um, uh, the attributes of the host, in this case, the intended audience. And so um, here our intended audience for the COVID work uh, is communities of color and particularly young people of color. And the communication attributes that we are examining have to do with narrative uh, and storytelling techniques of public health communication, arts-based techniques rather than uh, fact-based, emotion-driven communication rather than fact-based, and bottom-up rather than top-down public health communication. So we're playing with this, the wheel here in the sphere framework to see how it might influence uh, public health where it's scaled. So what we're gonna do here is um, uh, take a look at just one part of this uh, campaign. And the campaign that the young people, the name that the young people came up with was Survival Pending Revolution. This is a COVID vaccination campaign. And um, I'm gonna share with you a poem that was written by uh, Nia um, and filmed at my hospital. You'll see I have a cameo in it. Uh, and uh, it's called Survival Pending Revolution. And for those of you who are knowledgeable about black history, um, Survival Pending Revolution um, was really uh, came from uh, Huey Newton's work with the Black Panthers uh, when uh, they were setting up uh, clinics and um, uh, free breakfast and lunch uh, for the black community um, in, in Oakland. Um, and the idea was we have to be alive for the revolution. We need to survive. We have to support our communities to be able to survive on a day-to-day -day basis to be around to fight the larger fight. And this was sort of where the young people themselves landed when thinking about the idea of receiving COVID vaccines or not. So I'm gonna ask Dylan, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing, right, Dylan? Um, let me stop yes. sharing. Um, and hand over the sharing to you. And we'll take a look. This is a six minute video poem from Nia. Right. Can you all see that? Yeah, you just have to expand it. Perfect. My sliding closet door slams back and forth against the wall as I contemplate what makes most sense to wear. I push past my favorite unapologetically black tees as if they alone give my skin permission to breathe freely. Today, I'm not sorry for my complexion. 
Just consumed with insatiable caution and distrust, the insidious evils of racism haunt me like a shadow that still exists in the dark. Maybe this is paranoia, or more like the last fingernail digging into a dying grip on this fantasy of controlling what I can't. Now slithering away again, it is 10 a.m. on an overcast Wednesday morning, one hour before my vaccine appointment. Even in my disjointed brush movements, it does not escape me how inaccessible this time is for most working folks. That losing this many hours in a workday could mean losing a job. Or that I made this appointment online without wondering how to pay for the internet I access. On the ride there, I hold closely the black community experiencing poverty at 2.5 times the rate of white folks in this country for whom this might not be possible. Roughly 30 minutes, several cities, and $21.04 later, I pull up to the site and wait in line until the white man approaches me calmly, says he will be administering my vaccine. He does not introduce himself, but I see his name at his station, Jeremy. He motions toward the chair. Have a seat, make yourself comfortable. His voice glides gently across our shared, fractured, mask-filtered air with a soft kindness, perhaps to build a bridge between my expected nervousness and his assumed expertise. And all I could think is this man wears the skin I'd never trusted to manage my health. Can't help but replay when health officials first announced new vaccine. The name Henrietta Lacks still echoes twice as loudly back. Thunderclaps Tuskegee experiment 10 times, tightening a chest already hypertension prone. Centuries of forced sterilization, false beliefs of a higher pain tolerance still ongoing and still shrieking silently underneath my skin as it prepares to be pierced. I know American healthcare to be one of many aliases for systems that don't live up to their name. My health not its objective, my care not the central priority at stake. At least American gets me through the hospital door, which does not guarantee I walk any better or wiser or at all, especially when hospitals are more likely to call security on their black patients and visitors than their white ones. I don't know what health insurance will protect me from this literal health insecurity. This is why every medical practitioner I've ever chosen is a woman of color. Perhaps this is where medical racism's unshakable shadow is most unseen, but at least there's a higher chance that she knows the intricacies of the dark. I wonder if Jeremy knows black women are three times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white men. Yet the unknown and unanswered questions I have about this vaccine make me feel equally as grim. What exactly is in that syringe? What are its long-term effects? How can I trust it when I don't trust the system it came from? How many times will I be asked to make blind decisions for my survival, for his? I can list a million reasons not to be here, yet I am anyway. They say black and Latinx folks are getting vaccinated around half the rate of white folks in the US, even though we've had higher rates of cases and deaths. And I immediately think of a recent Saturday Night Live skit made a game show about black folks' unwillingness to get vaccinated, an American cultural staple of reducing black trauma in entertainment. I wonder how long these manufactured laughs will last until we become the new face of anti-vax. And they tell every black person who did not get their shot that death is a bed they deserve to lay in, but get this. In the first month these vaccines were available, they went largely to communities that were least impacted. This pierces me much harder than that shot. Less than a pinch worth of pain, the silent shrieking underneath my skin does not manage to escape as Jeremy recites side effects on a timeline until I am considered safe. And he confidently states, that's it? as if the only suffering worth mentioning ends two weeks after my second shot. Three million people dead and counting globally. And the US still spit back America first at India's ask for help before remembering its status as a self-appointed global superpower. 
patents and vaccine holds have already set back Africa's development back up to five years, which is to say racism shadow has always been bigger than the sidewalks tracing of my body. I got my shot to stand with the people who know this darkness like the back of their hand. And for my elders, whose belly rolls have never succumbed to an apology for their blackness, all I want to do is hug them and tell them that they are the reason I know glory to be human. And for me, to gamble on the promise of another tomorrow and live to tell about it, even if it means a walk through the valley of the shadows. Thanks, Dylan. So yeah, think a little bit about how Nia's poem made you feel and what her main message was and how, how different both of those are compared to the kinds of public health communications you may have seen around COVID vaccination. And um, we were interested in examining the degree to which this kind of messaging, which uh, is known as um, a critical communication theory, um, uh, compares to traditional public health messaging. So in the traditional approach, the messenger is the experts, uh, the doctors, the public health leaders, or celebrities. In critical communication theory, it's the regular person, often a compelling person, but who reflects the community uh, that represents the audience. Strategy in traditional public health messaging typically is fact-based or sometimes fear-based. Whereas in critical communication approaches, uh, the problem is contextualized and we elucidate that complexity and ground it in the reality or so-called lived experience of the individual. In traditional communications in public health, the form of the arguments tend to be related to logic and cognition, whereas in critical approaches, they tend to be more narrative and emotion-based. The perspectives and positionalities uh, in the traditional approach tend to be more authoritative, top-down, directive and unambiguous, you need to get a COVID vaccine, no questions asked, here are the side effects, don't worry. Whereas in critical communication, it's more naturally questioning, critical, with ambiguous and ambivalent messages and non-directive approaches that allow the individual to think for themselves critically and make their own decisions. The settings for traditional communications tend to be unique, exceptional, and dramatized, whereas critical communication approaches tend to have everyday settings as the one you saw here today. And the genres in traditional typically are educational or instructional, whereas in critical approaches, they tend to be more creative through the use of art, poetry, and film. So we were interested in exploring whether this sort of precision communication at a public health level, how would that land with the intended audience? And we're gonna be carrying out some quantitative work, but I wanted to share with you um, some uh, preliminary results from a large focus group we did where we had um, the target audience view content from survival pending revolution campaign, as well as content uh, from uh, a very, very well done state of the art public health communication campaign around COVID vaccination called The Conversation. You may be familiar with it. This was hosted by uh, black comedian and actor W. Kamau Bell. It features um, many of my uh, colleagues, black doctors um, in white coats uh, talking about the COVID vaccine and the epidemic. And then a similar version for Latinx uh, audiences with Latinx physicians, nurses, health workers, et cetera. So we, we heard a number of themes uh, as people compared and contrasted the two campaigns. Um, the most uh, predominant theme that emerged uh, in comparing the two approaches was that they felt that there was an oversimplification of the problem of COVID and its solutions of vaccination 
when presented in the Kaiser Family Foundation's The Conversation versus the validation of complexity, what you saw here today, for example, in Nia's poem, when presented in Survival Pending Revolution. And that those watching the conversation frequently described how turned off they felt by the relatively superficial and disrespectful analysis of the uncertainty related to COVID vaccination that's faced by marginalized populations. Um, and here you have some representative quotes. I think um, for the second video at the bottom here, that was the survival pending revolution. There was just so much more context to like something that might seem very binary, right? Like you're either getting vaxxed or not, but it's just so much more than that. And I appreciate that being expressed in the second video. And the second video, I think, did a better job of validating people's actual concerns around the healthcare system. Another theme we heard when people were comparing the two campaigns, the, the critical communication campaign and the traditional one, was the ability to harness emotion. Uh, participants reflecting on the approach used in A Walk Through the Valley really valued the poet's ability to communicate the authentic emotional struggle she was going through as she prepared to get vaccinated. For me, the second one was more powerful. It definitely like pulls at my heartstrings. I thought it was a powerful narrative through poetry and images. I love the specificity of the narrator story, like you know, hearing the specific $12, $20 ride share really hit. I felt like it really captured a genuine experience that's hard to capture just with words. Another theme was not only that complexity matters, but that historical and racialized context matters that um, participants reported a greater openness to the messages of the survival pending revolution campaign as a result of the inclusion of socio-political context, including men mentions of structural racism and structural determinants of health. So this participant said it really discussed not only COVID, but so many underlying issues that come when getting the vaccine because of all these different systems in place. The second video resonated with me with more context. And I loved how it expanded into like larger systemic issues like the Tuskegee references. It felt like it was kind of just showing like, this is how we got here. And then lastly, to make sure that I don't paint a false picture that this is gonna cure cancer or solve our problem with COVID, uh, there were questions about credibility and actionability for both sets of messengers and campaigns. There was no consensus around whether the spokespeople were felt to be cred credible. In some instances, participants felt that the naturalistic style of the poems narrowed social distance and allowed participants to relate to the poets. In other instances, pa participants questioned the intent of the poet and felt that the poet and the poetry were being appropriated by those in power to do their bidding, to convince people of color to get vaccinated so as to protect everyone. So this is not without risk. And I think it raises an important caveat around partnering um, with community members to do critical communication approaches. So in summary, precision communication is an approach to promote health by aligning the attributes of health communications with the characteristics, preferences, and needs of specific audiences. I provided two examples of applied health communications research that revolve around harnessing precision communication for health equity. In the case of clinical communication, we showed how linguistic complexity concordance and universal tailoring styles can promote shared meaning for patients across health literacy and reduce health literacy related disparities dramatically, although not reducing extant uh, uh, disparities by race ethnicity. And then we showed how a public health communication campaign that used an arts-based spoken word approach and a critical communication approach to vaccination that acknowledged the lived experience and context of the intended audience may promote health equity more effectively than a traditional, albeit very well done campaign. And I'll stop there, Michael, and pass it back to you. Thank you. All right, thank you for a terrific presentation. And let me just frame things for everybody. Uh, we've just heard three wonderful talks uh, from Drs. Cooper, Guy, and Schillinger. And we're gonna take a moment and have a panel discussion that will last about 12 minutes. Um, let me start us off with a question, and I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to personalize this. Uh, and I realize I never introduced myself, so here I am, Michael Otto. I'm a researcher at Boston University in psychological brain sciences, and my unit of analysis for everything I do is the person. I'm a person centered uh, for interventions for analysis. So how do we get someone like me, which I think I represent a lot of our listeners here today, how do we get someone like me to you know, spread out to consider 
dyads to consider institutions and culture and community. And I know the answer might be get some really good collaborators, but what would you say in addition to that? How do we get our uh, individual focused behavioral scientists to spread out a bit? I mean, I'll give a pat answer and then pass it on to smarter people. The pat answer is it, it to shape your research question accordingly. Um, I think it starts with the research question and then everything else follows um, from that. But I'll I'll ask Lisa and Gilbert to go much more nuanced and sophisticated than that. No, I agree, Dean. I think, you know, when you do come up with your question, let's say your question is on an individual uh, level. It's something that you're trying to answer for, like what, why is an individual person behaving in a certain way or why are they, uh, why do they have a certain attitude or stance towards something is to, to immediately begin to think beyond that. Well, what are the other things that shape that individual? Like whether it be uh, life experiences or people within their social network or people within their environment, um, the kinds of organizations in which they, you know, uh, spend their time, like, I, I think really thinking in that sort of multi-level uh, ecological way is the way we move beyond thinking that everything is about um, a particular individual. So that's a start. And then again, um, you know, then of course, as you alluded to connecting with people who know how you go about measuring and studying, um, you know, phenomena at these different levels is, is very helpful. I think those are great answers. The, the other thing I might add is to use analogies. You know, when we think about, you know, how the body works, if you only focus on one organ and you, ex you don't think about any other organs, you know, in, and you think about the organ in isolation, that's incomplete, right, at, at a minimum and damaging in, in other ways. And so if we think of individuals living in isolation, that's not realistic. We are social beings. And so I think it's important to really think about, you know, if you're thinking, you know, if you think about an individual patient, you know, they have a family and so forth. And, and again, as the other speakers are saying, you start to have greater levels of abstraction. And maybe that's not a great answer, but hopefully that's one that can resonate with some people. You know, I, I'm, I'm seeing this, this multi-level way of thinking manifest itself in clinical medicine around the discussions related to trauma-informed care. I think we are now more clearly understanding the ways in which trauma, either you know, current or historical or, or in childhood, affects people's health and, and decision making. And that really that ability to expand beyond the cross-sectional look at the individual, I, I think um, in the context of trauma and health, it may provide a really instructive uh, example of how, how, how we've thought about trauma and mechanisms of disease uh, as, a, as a model. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, I have a question from out, if I recognize the name, out Houston way. Uh, this is a methods question. And how might a clinical researcher measure the impact of structural racism on mental health? And what factors would they need to include to ensure the most feasible and accurate representation of its effect? Suggestions there. I'll, I'll give a start and I welcome all, everybody else. Um, so I, I think generally right now in the literature, how a, a lot of people are thinking about structural racism is really about neighborhood kind of effects. So there's a lot of these metrics that are like, you know, you know, based on your census tract or your county or your, you know, your, your state, people are developing metrics of structural racism that are sort of variations thematically of things like segregation. Um, and they're, Sort of lots of nuanced ways that people are thinking about it. Um, I, I think that's one way, and there are studies where people are looking at how these neighborhood effects and these neighborhood indicators of what you know they might consider structural racism are correlated with things like psychiatric outcomes and so forth. I think getting at what I was seeing about institutions and their true connections, I don't think the field is there yet. I think right now people are really starting to think about institutional racism, like the behavior of specific institutions. And I think that's a great way to start. And 
like when I talk to um, you know my my students and postdocs and, and junior colleagues, I say it's good to start with an institution and then build out from there. So really understand banking or really understand the education system and then understand how these institutions are connected to another. I actually think it's probably not going to be for another 10, 20 years before we really get a better handle on institutions and their interconnections. So I don't think we're quite there yet. Any other answer? Gil, do you, maybe could, could you say a word, Gil or Lisa, on sort of the, the allostatic load line of research and whether that is that barking up the wrong tree? Is that sort of something that could be built on? Yeah. So Gil, Gil, I don't know if you want to go first. You, I consider you the main expert on this. I, I feel like the allostatic load literature is capturing sort of the outcomes, which are the, the biological outcomes of uh, structural, you know, racism. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm sort of with Gil, but I really think a lot of the neighborhood level factors um, and the environmental exposures and things like that are where I would focus um, on the sort of the inequities in exposures to harmful environments, uh, whether they be social or physical environmental things, you know, like, uh, you know, food insecurity or, you know, something to do with quality of housing or um, environmental uh, pollutants, yeah, and, those yeah. kinds of things. Um, obviously, we can't measure everything. So like Gil said, you know, depending on the specific question, there might be a particular structural or group of structural factors that you think might have a, a specific uh, role in contributing to that uh, disparity. And then that's where um, I would devote a lot of my energy in trying to get a good, good measure of that. But fortunately, we have things that go beyond self-report now. We have geospatial measures and we have um, other like databases, things related to crime, for example, exposure to crime. Those are the kinds of uh, data that can be used and superimposed uh, along with individual level, um, you know, behaviors and uh, attitudes and biological measures to help us better understand what we're seeing. That, that was a lovely answer. So I'll, I'll just yield to you because I, I know we only have like three minutes left. So. Well, and watching the three minutes, let me, I there there was one question that I actually didn't answer. I said I would try to answer it live, so I don't know if you saw that. Um, it no, was, I missed it. Go ahead. Yeah, there was a question that said, "In what are some ways clinicians can work with their patients to reinforce or foster resilience against the mental health related effects of structural racism?" So you know. I'll start and then, of course, my colleagues, please jump in. But I, one of the things I wanted to say is that my colleague, Sam Saha, and I actually wrote an article about this because um, physicians were seeing so many patients coming in with um, race-related trauma, especially during the pandemic. And so we wrote an article that just sort of provided some guidance around that. And we said, really, that physicians should sort of approach um, uh, the issues around structural racism, as well as interpersonal racism, just like they would other sensitive issues or issues related to grief and trauma. Like really just being open to hearing people's stories and validating uh, you know, their emotions and their concerns around it, um, offering concrete support when possible, but really the fact of just acknowledging that it exists and that it's unfair and that, um, you know, people aren't imagining it is a, is a good step and not sort of dismissing it or, you know, saying, well, everybody's, you know, got to deal with stress and, and problems with really acknowledging that there's been a long standing uh, history around this. So those are a start and there's their are articles uh, that we've written there, one by Sam Saha and myself in the Journal of General Internal Medicine that talks about this. Uh, I, I like a close on the theme of resilience. Uh, either of our other panelists want to comment on resilience here at the end, or is there any brief question that you've been dying to ask each other? I don't know how often you sit on the same panel, but it has to be a quick one no. in our last minute. No? We we don't sit on panels often, and I you know I have great admiration for both of these guys. 
I would love to hear more. I think we are still focusing a lot. We're still using a, a lot of a deficit lens in a lot of our work. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts around how we shift that towards looking at like an asset-based approach. Like what are the strengths that exist in communities that have experienced social marginalization and what kinds of strengths and assets should we be looking at so that we can identify those sort of positive things that can be enhanced rather than always looking at the negative side of things? Well, I would just add um, that, uh, you know, I think as clinicians, we are trained to find pathology, right? And to, to find the risk factors and the exposures. But just as I put in my conceptual framework, um, you know, the public health literacy pathway is about the balance or imbalance between exposures and resources. And these resources often relate to the assets that, that individuals bring to the encounter and bring to their lives and their families. And so I think it's as important when one elicits the story in the kind of that phase of the visit when you're connecting with the patient. As, as I think your video showed with, with the patient who was talking about her antihypertensive regimen, she started by talking about her life. And you know, if you just go a little bit with those, those stories and you ask one more question, you begin to learn about people in a different way. And you can then, I mean, she talked about church, for example, just one example, and the importance of, of God in her life. That is a tremendous uh, resilience factor for so many people. So I think it really falls upon us, both as researchers and clinicians, to be inquisitive on that, not the deficit only, but also the resilience and the assets, because obviously people are doing well enough to get to your office, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess and the only thing I'm going to give you the remaining 30 seconds. <laughs> The only thing I would add is when we think about resilience, we don't just think about it at the person level, although certainly human personal agency is important, but I wanna maybe give a plug to a great colleague and friend of mine, Sarah Sanson, who's been thinking about structural resilience. And if we think about you know, the structural organizations like the Black Panthers that uh, was alluded to earlier and so forth, you know, all those things can also help push back on and, and foster uh, health equity. Well, I would once again like to thank all our speakers for absolutely excellent presentations. I want to thank uh, Dr. Jean Simmons uh, at NIA for uh, her introduction and, of course, the ongoing role of program in the Science of Behavior Change uh, program. And I want to remind everybody that uh, there are resources on the web for the Science of Behavior Change. I'll let you search them out, but NIH Science of Behavior Change will get you to measures repository, et cetera. And I want to again thank uh, Dylan and Isa for uh, making this happen and go so well. Thank you all. Thanks for tuning in.